Wow. What's up, fellas? What's up, brothers and sisters in Jesus, my, my Lord and Savior? How you guys doing? What's going on? How are you? Men are as weak. Some convert. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's going on here? Somebody converted? And I got to trim my beard. I look old. Right? Yeah. Follow the Holy Spirit. We love you, Father. Oh, Lord Jesus, we love you. Wash us in your blood. Purify us in your blood. Holy Spirit, we love you. Fill us for the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, amen. Yeah, I was going to try to live stream last night, but I was in the airport and on planes all day. So by the time I got here, I was dead tired, right? I was dead tired. You know, so I even though I had said, if the Lord Jesus wills, uh, wills I was going to do a live stream yesterday. I was in the airports all night, all day, since 10 in the morning yesterday. And I didn't get to the hotel room till around 8. Was it 8? No, no, till around 9. You know? So I'm away, as you can see, if you guys are on my social media page, I'm away doing recordings. And if you were on my social media page, I also did a live stream with El Fadi. And I put the picture where I got to see Jay Smith, right? Saw him last night, and in the morning we had breakfast together, even though they did the eating. And then Al Fadi and I were busy recording a new series, Trinity in the Old Testament, and then we're going to do Trinity in the New Testament. And then some of you caught the live stream we did. So I have a lot of free time. I'm in my hotel room. So I said, hey, you know what? Maybe I should do a live stream. What do you guys think? I don't know, man. I have my beard. I look old. My goodness, I'm 47 years young. Okay, what is this guy talking about, this Tony King? What's Tony King talking about? What What are you on? Oh, can God be holy without a spirit? Or so? I have no idea what this guy's talking about. I think we're going to have to send him Mary way. Yes, Sam, I use a lot of your teaching, Christian friends, to draw her back. Into who? I didn't get to see who you're talking about. We're waiting for more folks to show up. I know it's a little later than usual is it it's eight o'clock right how is it yeah I no i think so come on life is good you know i look better than fine hey niles what's happening friend you keeping it real down in niles okay it depends if i give you a shout out and say i love you what does that do for me what do i get in return here you are you have a do you have a youtube channel sophia films do you have a YouTube channel? How many subscribers do you have? How many subscribers do you have? Just want to make sure. Protestant believers here? Good. Oh, yeah, you watched that show, Carly Waller, when I was doing the show with, with Vocab and David Wood, 10K? Oh, you're kidding me. How many did you used to have, Sophia Films? Yeah, you should celebrate Christmas, Niles. Uh, for the for the very reason that the world associates Christmas with the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and <clears throat> you use that as an opportunity to preach what Christmas is all about: Emmanuel, God with us, the birth of the God Man, God becoming a man, a babe for our salvation. And I'll talk about Christmas, Lord Jesus willing. Maybe before Christmas, I'll do a session on the true meaning of Christmas, which has been forgotten by many people in the West. 1611 on his way to heaven. It's been a while. I haven't seen you. Anyway, Sophia Films, I'm going to give you a shout out. Now, why do you call yourself Sophia? Is it because you are a sister in the Lord or Sophia Films means films that are full of wisdom? Because many people may not know that the word Sophia in Greek means wisdom. No, not truth. Oh, my goodness. Wisdom. Wow, you're butchering the Greek. The Greek for truth is aletinas. Aletinas. Sophia means wisdom. So Sophia films means films that are wise. Films that are filled with wisdom. Aren't you being humble? Yeah. Phileo Sophia. Aqua Vita. 
Phileo, Sophia means love of wisdom. When you contract it, you get philosophy. Right? And I've said this before. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to repeat it again. One of Jesus' names in the New Testament, name given to our Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament is Sophia. Did you know that? Franz Toma, where you been, man? Aren't you on my, aren't you on my social media pages, Facebook? I've been announcing this blasphemous film, The First Temptation, all over my social media pages. And thank the Lord Jesus Christ for the uproar. Christians all over the world, hundreds of thousands, in fact, if not millions, spoken against this film, condemned it, and condemned Netflix and glory to Jesus Christ. We Christians need to take a stand for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. And may the Lord Jesus save me from being a hypocrite to practice what I preach, right? And take a stand for his glory. When we take a stand for Christ, we don't kill people. We don't inflict physical harm. We take a stand by making our voices heard, right? So we do that, which is acceptable biblically. And the Bible never gives us a license to kill someone who mocks Jesus. But it does give us a license to speak out against such blasphemies and do what we can without violence to stop such blasphemies against our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes, for those of you who wanted to know, one of Jesus' names is Sophia. And where do you find that? In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24, the New Testament documents were written in Greek by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Guys, come on. I'm down 83. I was getting about 220. I'm getting sad. Zena, how are you, sister? For, forgive me for not announcing to you that I'm going live. I forgot. Anyway, in the Greek New Testament, 1 Corinthians 1, 24, Paul calls our Lord Jesus Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now notice, 1 Corinthians 1, 24. Thank our brother Protestant believer for serving me to serve you, helping me to help you for the glory of Jesus. Guys, read 1 Corinthians 1, 24. It says, But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Folks, in Greek, the word wisdom is Sophia. Jesus, the Sophia of God. Let me get you the interlinear because I know you guys are a bunch of skeptics. You don't trust anything I say, and I don't believe you. I wouldn't trust anything I say either. Right, here you go. Hold on. All right. Let me get it to you. Bunch of skeptics, man. I can't handle your skepticism. Here it is. Click there. Thank God for modern technology. Thank the Lord that all of these resources have been made available by the sovereign grace of the triune God, free of charge, and it's a fingertip away, right? Everything good is from the triune God. Everything evil, bad is from fallen creatures. Now, click on that link. Don't take my word for it. If you read, it says, Christon theu dunamin, Christ of God, the power, ke theu sophien. Sophian. Do you see the word Sophian? That's the accusative case of Sophia. So in Greek, Jesus is called Sophia, meaning wisdom. Right? Do you guys see it? Everyone see it or Sophian? That's the accusative. Accusative, that's Greek is an inflective language. So the words will take on specific case cases to signify whether the word is the subject of the sentence, the object of the sentence, the indirect object, or is it in the genitive, meaning showing possession, right? It's complicated, and it's above my pay grade. You know, I'm no scholar of biblical languages. I'm a student of the scholars, but I do my best to understand by the grace of God's Holy Spirit. What's up, say Christian? What's up, buddy? All right. So, guys, remember, one of Jesus' name is Sophia, because Sophia is the Greek word for wisdom, right? Right? Is that clear? Did everyone get it? We love you, Father. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Energize us, empower us, and fill us with your spirit, Father, in Jesus' name. Energize us spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically. Protect us from attacks of the enemy. And Father, anoint the words of my mouth to speak truth clearly, recall passages 
<clears throat> perfectly and interpret them correctly in the power of your Holy Spirit. Fill us with wisdom from your spirit, knowledge from your spirit, life and love and passion from your spirit to know your word, Father. And grant me the health I need to do this for your glory, Father. And Father, anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants and guide this conversation. And Father, we ask in Jesus' name, please cover us, cover our loved ones, cover my daughters, Father, with the holy blood of Jesus. Cleanse them, cleanse us, and purify us in the blood of Jesus. And seal us, Father. Seal our loved ones. Seal my daughters, Father, by your spirit. Please, Abba, save us from Satan and his children and from all the corruption of this world and save us from our own flesh, Father. And help me, Lord, not to be a hypocrite, but a doer of your word. Please save me from my hypocrisy and save me from my flesh. Not to fail you, not to shame you, but to glorify you. We love you, Abba. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Bring those that you want to be here to hear and learn. In Jesus' name, amen. I called you idiots. What's up, Al? Sorry, brother, I didn't send you the notice, Al, that I'm doing a live stream. I've been so busy, I'm out of town. As you can tell, I'm in a hotel room. I called you idiots, did I? Lord willing, before Christmas, pray for me. I want to do a Christmas message. Break down the Christmas story, right? Your creatures of repetition. I'll be preaching to the choir, you know, but it's good to hear things over and over again. So it can become second nature by the grace of God's spirit. All right. Now, if you're wondering why I titled Why Christian Prince and David Can't Deal with the Cup, obviously it's clickbait. Someone accused me of being deceptive. I felt like blocking him because he thought I was a Mohammedan, right? But it's not only clickbait. It's because Muslims, sometimes in the comment section of Christian Prince's videos and sometimes in live stream, bring up specific questions. And Christian Prince does an excellent job of dealing with it, as David would. So when I come in and I provide an answer to these objections, I don't want anyone to assume that I'm responding because I feel that Christian Prince or David Wood gave a less than adequate reply. No, the more Christians answer the same objections, the better, because you get a variety of voices, right? <clears throat> from a variety of Christian personalities empowered by the Spirit to thoroughly refute objections against the glory of the triune God, against Jesus Christ, and against the Holy Scriptures. What I want to deal with is the specific objection leveled by Muslims that God engaged in what's called cosmic child abuse. Have you guys heard it? Are you guys in the saddle? Are you ready? Pray for over 200. I got spoiled. I was seeing about 220 people. I'm down to 99. 99 red balloons. 99. I'm fighting. Thank you, Russo Ed. Okay. May the Lord Jesus beatify me to be pleasing to the sight of his servants, even though I feel old. Okay. Cosmic child abuse. These Muslims have picked up on the slurs and blasphemies of liberal critics of the Bible and even certain Christians who mean well but choose to describe specific Christian doctrines in a manner that is picked up by the children of Satan to blaspheme the Lord Jesus Christ. What is cosmic child abuse? Well, Shibra Ali picked it up from liberals, and just recently I heard a debate, and I called out these Muslims to debate me. I asked my friend to challenge them if they debate me because I promised that I would take both of them and their own stream, live stream or <clears throat> Zoom room and decimate them and shame their prophet for their blasphemies. Cosmic child abuse. Why do they <clears throat> use that? Because they say that if you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus was an unwilling participant in the crucifixion. Okay, this is where I need your undivided attention by the power of the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit enables us to understand the Word of God, and that I'll be used of the Spirit to bless you for the glory of Jesus Christ. They say, if you read Matthew, Mark, specifically Matthew and Mark, not so much Luke, right? Matthew, yeah, even Luke. I, I, my apologies, I'm sorry. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Jesus was an unwilling participant in the crucifixion. 
They say that John is later and more theologically embellished so that John doesn't give you the history of Jesus, but he gives you the theology of what he believes Jesus meant, so he's not reliable. And in John's gospel, Jesus is a willing participant, willing to die to bring about the salvation of God's people, but not in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So are we ready to unpack that and destroy this blasphemy by the power of the triune God and magnify Jesus and expose Muhammad for the son of Satan that he is, right? And what do they, what do they mean? Andrew Martin got it. If Jesus was willing to die, then why do we find him praying in the garden, according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, begging the Father to take away the cup? And yet, instead of taking away the cup, the Father insisted and imposed the cup upon his son so that the Father's guilty, and God forgive me for repeating such blasphemy, of cosmic child abuse, forcing his son to suffer wrath for sinners. You understand the objection? Tony King. Is Tony King a believer? Can you send? I don't know. The admins are here, and I don't know what's going on here. I don't know if Tony King is a believer. Is he a believer? Because he's saying some stuff that's really baffling me. I don't know if he's uh, blaspheming the triune God about not being holy. I don't get it. Right? I don't get it. This is what happens when brothers like Tony decide to go on tangents and open up discussions not related to the topic. They throw me off. And when I'm thrown off, everyone else is thrown off. You see? I don't get it. Yeah. And by the way, Groang, I just wanted to correct something. And I think you saw it in text. You said, no one walks away from Jesus if they met Jesus. I'm paraphrasing your words, Groang. Your name is so hard. I don't know why you chose that name. Can Yeah. Why would you choose a name that only half a percent of the world's population can can pronounce? Groang. Well, Judas met Jesus. Judas walked with Jesus for over three years. Judas did miracles in the name of Jesus, and he still betrayed Jesus and walked away. All right? Clint, thank the triune God. I didn't bring anyone, and I'm not trying to be humble. Clint Kramer, let me repeat. I'm not trying to be humble. I'm being honest. I can't bring anyone to Christ. <clears throat> if I could, then everyone I preach to would come to Christ. It's the Holy Spirit of the living God who brings people to Christ, and he is pleased to use human agents to do so. So praise the Holy Spirit of the Father and Son for using me to bring you back to Christ. Give him the glory, not man, and may the Lord never allow me to take credit for the work of the Holy Spirit. Never, ever, and may the Lord grant me true, genuine humbleness. Right? So praise God, Clint Kramer has returned to the feet of Jesus because the Holy Spirit used his servants, his human instruments and vessels <clears throat> to restore people to the love of Jesus. What would I say about that, Sophia? It's, it's like asking me, what would I say since Muslims believe in the virgin birth? So let me deny the virgin birth, Sophia. Let's deny the virgin birth, Sophia, because Muslims affirm it. Just because Muslims affirm a truth of Scripture, meaning the Bible, affirm something true about the true God doesn't make their religion true or their God our God. So I don't understand what your question is, right? Right? With me there? Now let's discuss this question. How do we deal with the fact that Jesus was an unwilling participant in the cross, so the Father imposed on Christ the crucifixion and a sort of cosmic child abuse, God forbid such blasphemy, and because of that blasphemy, I'm going to expose Muhammad and disgrace him further for being the agent of Satan that he was, because these Muslims have no shame, and they need to be <clears throat> shamed, humiliated for their blasphemy against their God and master and judge, Jesus Christ. Okay, are you with me there? Are we ready now to focus so we can learn? Trusting the Spirit to use me to speak truth without error for the glory of Christ. And guys, help me to help you focus, focus, right? Focus. Do not go into side talks or tangents. Let's focus. Let me be a blessing to you and not cause anyone to stumble. Okay. Obviously, if you go to the Gospel of John, Jesus is a willing participant. So they'll say, well, that's our proof. You're proving our point. 
You're proving our point. You need to go to John, which is later and more theolo theologically embellished, because John's Jesus is not the Jesus of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The Jesus of Matthew, Mark, and Luke is different from the Jesus of John. And so to go to John to answer the question only confirms their objection against you. And so what I've taught you, and I'm going to teach you again, and I'm going to emphasize this again, when someone cites a particular author or a particular writing, don't run to some other book or author to answer the objection, as many of you do. Like if someone quotes Mark, you run to Philippians 2. Christ humbled himself. Well, that's Paul. That's not Mark. Try to refute the objection from the very book or author that the enemy of the gospel is using, and then refute the objection, <clears throat> demolish the argument, until he or she has no excuse for their unbelief and perverting scripture, right? Is David Wood live streaming right now? Someone confused me. Is he doing a live stream or no? Oh, my goodness. Why would he do a live stream? Darn it. With the timing of this. Who's he doing it with? Oh, boy. Yeah, he's kind of boring as it is. And even though he's boring, he gets about a 1,000. Okay. Who's IP? I have no idea. Oh, that guy? Man, that guy's boring as pits too. Puts me to sleep. Yes, IP, you're boring. Live with it. Okay, let's focus. Okay, now, let's go to the passage. Mark 14, 33 to 38. Yeah, Mark 14, 33 to 38. Good, Protestants. Say, so you guys are boring and inspiring philosophy bores me to tears. So you're trying hard, bro, but you don't inspire anyone to do philosophy. Mark 14, 33, verse 38. Let's read, guys. Right? Let's focus now. Mark 14, 33 to 38. Let's focus. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, Peter and and James and John, and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. He was troubled and sorrowful because his time had come. And saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little, right? <clears throat> went forward a little <clears throat> and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, pay attention to the language of the text. If it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping, and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldest not thou watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit is truly ready, but the flesh is weak. So here is the objection. This is cosmic child abuse. Jesus did not want to die on the cross. Now let's look at Matthew 26, 39. Matthew 26, 39 to find something similar, right? Matthew 26, 39. And see. Let's look at what it says. Sorry about that, folks. Okay, sorry about that. I lost my place. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. You see? Cosmic child abuse. God forbid such blasphemy. Jesus was begging the father, remove the cup from me. But the father said, no, you're going to have to drink the cup, forcing Jesus against his will to die because Jesus wasn't a willing participant. Now, as Christians, how do we address this objection? As Christians, how do we address this objection? Right? Anyone? Anyone? Before we answer, let's go to Matthew 26, verse 42. Matthew 26, verse 42. Matthew 26, verse 42. See, true, Trinity, you're not paying attention. Because Trinity 1, 2, 3 is not paying attention, I'm tempted. Uh, I don't know. Trinity 1, 2, 3. Which part of my earlier discussion that to go to John to prove your case, you just ended up confirming the Muslim objection against you 
Why are you now helping the Muslim to attack the Gospels? Trinity 1, 2, 3. Guys, what did I just say? This tells me he's not paying attention. I don't know why then you come to my session, you're not paying attention. Did I not just say, they will tell you, you need to go to John because John is later, more theologically embellished, and John presents a different Jesus from the Jesus of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So what did Trinity 1, 2, 3 did? Quoted John to prove their accusation, not refuting them. Why does Trinity 1, 2, 3 think that he's responding to the objection? Can someone help me understand? Why would someone quote John when I just got done explaining? That's their point. That's their argument. John presents a different Jesus from the Jesus of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Right? Let's go to Matthew 26, 42. So then that means when someone comes in the middle of a conversation, Sophia, it's better they just shut up, right? And not chime in. So they can learn. Matthew 26, 42. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Okay, pay attention. Both in Matthew and Mark, note how Jesus did not pray. Note how Jesus did not pray. He did not say, Father, take this cup away from me. He didn't pray that. In both Matthew and Mark, Jesus says, If it be possible, take this cup away from me, but not my will, your will be done. And then Matthew 20, 42, clearly has Jesus saying, O oh my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. So he's surrendering himself to the will of the Father and not imposing his will and demanding that the cup be removed. That's the first point. Are you learning? I want you to learn your faith, learn the Bible, uh, understand the depth of the Bible by the power of the Holy Spirit so that you can silence such blasphemers and shame them for the glory of Jesus. Okay? So right off the bat, right off the bat, right off the bat, notice how Jesus does not pray. I want to emphasize this. And I'm going to show you the miraculous, marvelous consistency between Matthew, Mark, and Luke and the Gospel of John. All right. Exactly, Al Dariush. He got it. He did not say, Father, take this cup away from me. Period. Full stop. He didn't insist, take it away from me. Notice his prayer because as the God man, he prays the perfect prayers. Oh, my Father, Abba, if it be possible, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. If it's possible, he's not even insisting, take it away, Father. No, no, no. If you can remove the cup from me, then remove it, but not my will. Your will. I'm not insisting and not demanding. And then Matthew 26, verse 42, made it clear. If this cup cannot be taken away, except that I drink of it, your will be done. He is surrendering completely to the will of the Father. So where is the cosmic child abuse? Where is the father imposing, insisting, <clears throat> enforcing something upon Jesus that Jesus is unwilling to accept? Even the nature of his prayer is saying, I will accept it if there's no other way. I will accept it <clears throat> if there's no other choice and no other way for mankind to be saved. So I'm not demanding you take it away. I'm not saying you got to take it away. I'm saying if it's possible, if there's another way for salvation, <clears throat> then remove the cup from me, but I'm not insisting my will, your will be done. Everyone got it? Yes, do hit the like button. That's first of all. Everyone got it? First, pay attention to the prayer. Jesus prays perfect prayers because he's the perfect God-man. So he doesn't say, Father, you better take this cup away from me. And if the Father didn't, then we'd say, see, that's child cosmic abuse because God imposed and forced his will upon the Son. Right? That's not what happened. If it be possible, 
take this cup away. Yet not my will, your will be done. Nevertheless, I'm not insisting that my will be done. Your will be done. And if there is no other choice but that I drink the cup, your will be done. Clear? I just want to make sure it sinks in. And that's why I'm repeating myself more than once because I want it to sink in by the grace of God so you understand how to address this blasphemy and shame those who would use this blasphemy against our Lord. Right? That's the first response. The second response, the very Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the very Gospels they're quoting, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, show us that Jesus, up until that point, prophesied that he must die and be raised from the dead, and even prepared his disciples that it is inevitable that I, the Son of Man, be beaten, mocked, spit on, scourged, killed, and be raised on a third day. So up until that point, he went out of his way to prepare his disciples for his death that he was fully aware of and had embraced. Let me show you. Kasai Christian's got a thing with Peter. He loves Peter for some reason because he wants to use Peter as an excuse to oppose the will of Christ in his life and then repent, hoping that Christ would restore him. What's your fascination with Peter, dude? You, you really like Peter a lot. But anyway, let's go to Mark 8. Let's read Mark 8, 31 and 32. Mark 8, 31 and 32. Mark 8, 31 and 32. And Sai Christian, I'm going to ask you, not stop me from going into these verses instead of trying to tempt me to go to your favorite passage, Peter. So I'm going to tell you, do not stop me from following this course because I don't want to follow your course and quote Peter. How about that, Sai Christian? Mark 8, 31, 32. Okay. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. Did you catch it? Must suffer many things. And be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. Here, here you go. Here's your boy, Peter. And P he spake that saying openly. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Are you happy now? Satisfied, Sai Christian? Are you satisfied? Okay. Did you catch it? Hold on, guys. Zena asked me a question. So let me stop what I'm talking about and answer the question. Was Jesus' resurrection on the third day proclaimed in the Old Testament? Hold on, Zina, because you're a Syrian, and what you say goes, and if you say, Sai Christian, he's going to be gone. Let me just stop. Hold on. Guys, I'm going to stop this conversation. Let me answer your question. Okay, did, I, did you get your answer? Okay. Mark 9. 30 to 31. I hope you enjoyed your answer. Mark 9, 30 to 31. Hold on. Hold on. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, Mark 9, 30, 31. And they departed thence and passed through Galilee, and he would not that any man should know it. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. Now notice, the second time, the second time, the second time Jesus announces his scourging, <clears throat> mocking, being mocked, beaten, killed, and being raised on the third day. All of which takes place before the night of his betrayal in the Garden of Geth Gethsemane. Everyone seeing it? Everyone saw it? Second time, right? Mark 10, 32 to 34. Mark 10, 32 to 34. Post what in Facebook? I don't even know what this guy's doing. Mark 10, 32 to 34. 
And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them, and they were amazed, and as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto, <clears throat> unto him, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. And they shall mock him and shall scourge him and shall spit upon him and shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. The third time our Lord Jesus announced his subsequent <clears throat> death and resurrection on the third day. Now, that doesn't mean he only predicted his death and resurrection three times. This, this simply means this is the third time in Mark that we are told that Jesus announced beforehand that I'm coming to Jerusalem specifically for this reason. He could have avoided going to Jerusalem, but I'm coming to Jerusalem specifically for this reason, that the scribes and the chief priests will hand me over to the Gentiles, their rulers, to beat me, to scourge me, to mock me, to kill me, and on the third day, I'll be raised back to life, right? And this is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because Matthew, Luke, repeat a lot of the material found in Mark, right? That's why you'll find material in Mark repeated in Matthew and Luke from the mouth of two or three witnesses, right? Now, let me just show you from Matthew, Matthew 16, 21 and 23. Let me give you one from Matthew. S same material repeated in Matthew, Luke that we just read in Mark. Thank you, Ron M. But notice, Ron M., I'm limiting my response to the Synoptic Gospels because the Muslim is saying, well, you need to go to John, but that just proves that John is more theologically embellished. It presents a more evolved picture of Jesus than what you find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So, Ron and everyone else, I'm showing you how to prove your point from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Right? Matthew 16, 21 to 23. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. For thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. You catch it? You are an adversary. You are opposing God's will for me. You're opposing why I came to this world. This is why I came to this world. To be beaten, scourged, mocked, killed, and be raised on the third day. Right? Everyone with me so far? So, grow on. Notice what you're doing. You're begging the question. You're assuming your, your <clears throat> position, not proving it. They'll tell you, who told you John wrote the Gospel of John? Biblical scholars say John was written later by some anonymous person or group. So, grow on. Christians who believe the Apostle John wrote the Gospel of John will believe you, right, and take for granted that John, who is an eyewitness and an apostle, was there, and he's accurately recording what the historical Jesus said in his presence as the Holy Spirit inspires him to recall what Jesus said and did and accurately write it down. But see, this is the thing. This is the problem with Christians. You surround yourself with like-minded believers. So there you can say, well, John wrote it. He was an eyewitness. And no believer is going to challenge you. But try to use that argument to a Bart Ehrman or an atheist, or an agnostic, or a Muslim, and watch the objections against your presupposition. Right? So what I'm trying to do is show you how to answer these objections on their own grounds, and then turn the objections against them and decimate their arguments and shame them for blaspheming Jesus, Muhammad's God, judge, and executioner. With me there? Everyone got it? So you made me lose my train of thought. I'm trying to give you the most accurate information possible, trusting the Spirit to fill me and fill you and guide me to speak truth 
for the glory of Christ. But see, this is what happens when you guys go into tangents. When you guys bring up issues that may seem relevant to the topic, right? Then what happens is I see the comment and I feel the need to address it and I get discombobulated. That's one of my imperfections as a teacher. So you guys aren't helping yourself when you bring up a point and I lose my train of thought. Right? In fact, here, growing up, I'm going to make it very hard for you. Show me a single place in the Gospel of John where the author says, I, John, wrote the Gospel. Show me where the Gospel of John names the author as John. No, you're not sorry. You just wanted to cause me to stumble. That's okay. Where in the Gospel of John, for the rest of you, does John say, it is I, John, writing the Gospel? Now, don't get me wrong. I do believe the Apostle John wrote the gospel under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But I believe it because I believe the church accurately preserved the names of the authors of these books. You will not find the name of the author of the fourth, fourth gospel called the Gospel of John in the gospel itself. Nor will you find the Gospel of Matthew identifying the author as Matthew. Nor will you find the Gospel of Mark identifying the author as Mark. Same with Luke and Acts. Okay, let me try this again, JSB. Maybe I wasn't clear. Show me where in the Gospel of John does it say that these are recorded by John. Are you playing games with me, splitting hairs over the word record and write? If I record something by pen, I'm writing it down. And if I'm writing down something, I'm recording it. Only a Christian could say, it says recorded, not written. You sure it doesn't say it's not written, JSB? You positive? John 20, 30, 31. Pedro Jr., if they recorded things anonymously, how then do you explain the fact that Paul identifies himself as the author of the epistles that he wrote using scribes? You see, you guys are going to destroy your witness. You sure about that, Pedro Jr.? Then why does Paul begin his letters by identifying himself as Paul, who wrote this letter and then at times identifies the scribe that he used to write this letter on his behalf. Too many chiefs, not enough Indians. Do I really need to prove that to you, Pedro? Do I really need to quote examples from the letters of Paul to show you where Paul says, I, Paul? Here, Romans 15, 15. Romans 15, 15. Sai Christian, who told you that the John who wrote Revelation is different from the Gospel of John? Where'd you get that from? 1611 is actually right. You're wrong. The early church says the same John who wrote the Gospel of John and the letters of John also wrote Revelation. Right? Romans 15, 15, nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you. I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God. I have written. Now, the question is, who is the I have? I have written. I have written. Who is the one who wrote I have written? Can anyone tell me? So note, the one who wrote this letter said, I have written. Now, who wrote it? According to Romans. Who wrote it according to Romans? Can anyone tell me? Romans chapter 1 verse 1. The very first verse of the first chapter. Romans 1 verse 1. Romans 1 verse 1. So Romans 15, 15. I have written. I wrote this. But Romans 1, 1 tells us who the I is. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Paul, I wrote this. Who's I? Paul. So, Pedro, where did you get that they wrote anonymously? They, they, some may have written anonymously. Others didn't.
You with me there? Second Peter one one. Jo, are you tempting me to block you, sir? I just, I'm just curious. Did you want to know? You want me to block you? I'll be more than happy to. It would be my pleasure. I mean, I, I love blocking people, so let me know. Second Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Simon Peter. In the Greek it says Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Simeon Peter. So where did you get, Pedro, that they wrote anonymously? Some may have written anonymously, but not everyone did so. Simon Peter, servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained a like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. James chapter 1, verse 1. See how we're going into tangents? Because we got brothers and sisters who love Jesus, and you guys love Jesus. That's why you're here. You're not here because of me. You're here because you love Jesus and are praying that Jesus will use me to bless you. And though you love the Lord, you guys go into tangents. And I'm trying to help you, to prevent you from using arguments that's going to be turned against you to embarrass you. Because you're my brothers and sisters, and I want you to be the best you can be. I want to be the best I can be, though I fail miserably for Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Pedro, you didn't qualify your statement. You said they wrote anonymously. Okay, if not everyone wrote anonymously, then that then it needs to be explained. Then why did the four gospel authors wrote, write anonymously? So how did your response provide an adequate refutation of the fact that the four gospel writers are anonymous? They don't identify themselves. If people do identify themselves, why didn't they identify themselves? James 1.1. 1, 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. So James says, James, a servant of God. So James tells you, it's me, James. Jude 1.1. 1, 1. So I can multiply this. I can go over and over and, and multiply this. Now, J Jude chapter 1, verse 1. It's only one chapter, 25 verses. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. So, guys, did you catch it? You're catching it. Yes, there are times in which people wrote anonymously, but that doesn't mean this was normal or the norm, the normal way of writing, because you have plentiful examples where the authors do identify themselves. So to say, well, the gospel writers wrote anonymously because that's what they did back then or that's how biographers wrote biographies not identifying themselves that's not necessarily true you get my point now i love you too jo and i don't know what's going on either that's why i said i'll block you because i love you bro don't be offended if you can joke then i can joke back don't hate, participate. What's wrong with you, Jay? You're so sensitive. Sam, you hurt my feelings, Sam. No more Heineken for you. All right? Everyone got it now? Typically, these sessions would take me much less time to finish if I was able to ignore comments, but I just want to make it clear why I don't Yeah, this guy, Jay, needs to go, right? I think this guy uh, needs to go. So, Jay, God bless you, brother. It was nice seeing you. Have a good Christmas, okay? The reason why I don't ignore comments, let me tell you. David Wood can ignore comments or not be bothered by them. Christian Prince, likewise. Let me just tell you why I don't ignore comments. Because I want to make sure that I am clear and you're getting it. And by the grace of God's spirit, not only are you getting it, but by the grace of God's spirit, you're able now to then articulate it. So that's why I interact with you guys, right? I want to make sure I'm not going too fast or speaking over you guys, but I'm simplifying things so you can then absorb the information, understand it clearly by the power of the Holy Spirit, then use it for the glory of Christ. 
So I know some people tell me, why do you interact with the comment section? It distracts us because that's why I'm doing it to interact with you, to make sure as a teacher that the students of the Holy Spirit, not my students, the students of the Holy Spirit are getting it. Because if you get it, that means now you're ready to respond to the objection. But if this objection is raised and you don't respond in an adequate manner, that means you're not getting it. You're pretending to get it or I'm a ter terrible teacher. Right? Right? And another thing the Christians need to learn, not to go on tangents but control themselves because you guys are at times not controlling your urge to say something that you think is relevant, but then it doesn't address the issue adequately and goes off topic and we waste time like we just did. All because Gro Ung said, gee, John wrote John. He was an eyewitness. What are they talking about? They wrote anonymously. What's the... Right? Everyone getting it now? No, don't worry, Grong. Don't get too sensitive. See, listen, you guys got to gird up your loins and you gals got to gird up your loins and be tough as nails and don't get sensitive when <clears throat> I give you positive, constructive criticism. Don't get sensitive. Sam, please don't hurt. Sam, please. Don't, don't be angry at me, Sam. If you're angry at me, I can't sleep when I <laughs> Right? Ron, if 1,000 people are in the chat, I'll go into mental meltdown. Okay. Mental meltdown. We lost the entire point, point of the subject. Let's see if you guys are really... Let's see if you guys were really paying attention. What was the focus tonight? What was the subject tonight? What were we talking about? Let's see how many of you guys lost the point. You got rational phobia. You got to be tough as nails. We are lambs sent in the midst of wolves. Didn't Jesus say that? I am sending you as lambs in the midst of wolves, right? We are surrounded by packs of wolves. And Satan is a roaring lion seeking to devour us. We need to stop being wishy-washy effeminates. We need to be bold lions, lionesses, warriors of the triune God. Right? If you're so sensitive that if I give you positive, constructive criticism, and at times I can be very tough with you, then what do you think unbelievers are going to do? You think they're going to be nice and mocking you, ridiculing you, shaming you, and embarrassing you? Go watch. YouTube, go watch Hatun Tash, Daniel of DCCI Ministries in Speaker's Corner. Notice the vitriol, the blasphemies, the insults that they have to endure week in, week out. In fact, they just posted a video where Ali Dawa, that little girl, that li I was going to say something else, that little girl and Muhammad Nakab, these two girls of Allah, these two hoors of Allah, Ali Dawa told Hatun Tash, do you want me to spit in your face? He threatened to spit in her face. Okay? And you guys, Sam, you're mean. You're not being Christ-like, Sam. Sam, you're not being Christ-like. You're hurting my feelings. I don't see Jesus in you. <laughs> really? Are you serious? Yeah, Sai Christian, they just posted the video, DCCI. Go watch it. He goes, I'll spit in your face. This little Agapano Amira, Sai Christian. You know I'm biting my tongue. Al Darius and Sai Christian, you guys are Syrians. Guys, if you don't know, Sai Christian and Al Darius are two of my best friends, my brothers whom I love. They're Assyrians and they're hot-blooded like me. They know what I'd really like to say at this moment to a man who thinks he's a man who tells a young woman, I'll spit in your face. Right? Anyway. Let me, let me calm myself down. Okay, let's get back to the issue. We went on tangents. Yeah. Oh, man, <laughs> you're tempting me to say something about this guy, and I'm going to get myself in trouble because either YouTube is going to shut me down 
or Christians going to say you're not Christ-like, or Muslims going to say you see he's a nasty Islamophobe, right? So I'm biting my tongue what I want to say. See, like Islamic queer, I mean engineer. Like Is Islamic queer, I mean engineer. See right here? He's laughing Muhammad's face off. LMAO, he's laughing Muhammad's face off. Right? Right? Okay. Anyway, let's get back to the issue. Let's get back to the issue. Okay, guys, you're with me so far, right? You guys with me so far? When we read Matthew, Mark, Luke in context and try to deal fairly with the context of these statements, we see that Christ, up until the point of the night of his betrayal in the Garden of Gethsemane, has already prophesied, spoken beforehand about his subsequent death and resurrection on the third day, right? Just to mention the verses we looked at again, the verses that we looked at again. Don't forget Mark 8, 31. We looked at Mark 8, 31, 32. Mark 9, 30 to 31. Mark 9, 30 to 31. So you don't forget the point. You focus and get clarity by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mark 10, 32 to 34. Mark 10, 32 to 34. And then we looked at Matthew 16, 21 to 23. Matthew 16, 21 and 23. Now let's look at one from Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record some of the same stories and events, right? Matthew and Luke contain information found in Mark, which is why some scholars think that Matthew and Luke use Mark as a source. Now, Luke 18, 31 to 34. Luke 18, 31, 34, notice what 34 says. To answer Zena's question, I think she abandoned ship and she went and betrayed me because she's on David Wood's channel. Luke 18, 31, 34. Then he took unto him the 12 and said unto them, Behold, we go, go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spitted on. And they shall scourge him and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. Then 34, notice what it says. And they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. Everyone with me? You understood? Matthew, Mark, and Luke have already recorded Jesus prophesying beforehand in advance that he must go to Jerusalem, betrayed by the chief priests and the scribes, handed over to the Gentiles, their rulers, to be scourged, to be beaten, to be mocked, to be killed, and be raised on the third day. Everyone got it? Mark, and yes, and Mark, Luke 18, 34 says, they couldn't understand because they're kept from understanding so they wouldn't be a stumbling block and hinder Jesus from accomplishing God's will. Further proof that Jesus knew why he came to the earth and came to the earth for that reason, that he came to the earth for this reason, to die for our sins. Mark 10, 45, and we're going to cross-reference it with Matthew 20, verse 28. Mark 10, 45. Cross-reference with Matthew 20, 28. It's the same saying that Matthew includes, if you believe Mark was written before Matthew. Mark 10, 45 and Matthew 20, 28. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Give his life a ransom for many. Now, how are you going to give up your soul, Jesus? Because the word there is suche, meaning soul. How are you going to give up your soul to ransom us? Matthew 20, 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So Matthew records the same saying found in Mark. Now, if you believe Mark was written before Matthew, you can either say they're both quoting the same oral tradition that the apostles passed on, word of mouth, or Matthew used Mark. It doesn't matter. The fact is they both record this saying of Jesus before Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Mark 14, 22 to 24. Mark 14, 22 to 24. Mark 14, 22 to 24. 
Mark 14, 22 to 24. Groang, are you still here? Groang. Mark 14, 22 to 24. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and break it and gave to them and said, take, eat, this is my body. Folks, this is right before the prayer. It's Mark 14, right before going to the Garden of Gethsemane, right before he prayed. He even says, this bread is my body broken for you. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Now, you guys want me to actually believe in that very chapter, Mark 14, right before he prays that prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus has already told us, my body shall be broken for you, and my blood will be shed for you, that all of a sudden... Jesus is now begging God, don't let me die. And God then imposes his will, says, no, you got to die. She, king of kings, it's a sister, a beautiful sister at that, who loves Jesus. Now let's see how Matthew records the saying of Jesus. Matthew 26, 26 to 28. Matthew 26, verses 26 to 28. She, not he. I don't know if she's a missus or a miss, but she often misses my sessions, but she doesn't miss me too much. <laughs> Just kidding. All right. Matthew 26, 26 to 28. Let's read. I know I'm being a little silly. And as they were eating, guys, same saying of Jesus. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread. And blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Wow, it's even more explicit in Matthew. Okay, what's my point? Guys, what's my point? Up until Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's already went out of his way to emphasize and reiterate and repeat to his disciples, I must die and my body will be broken and my blood shed to procure your redemption and the forgiveness of your sins. Clear? Yeah, it's okay, man. Just focus, medic. Clear? Let's go to Luke 22, 19 to 23. Luke 22, 19 to 23. Because I want to wrap this up so you guys understand that it's not cosmic child abuse because the father did not enforce and impose the crucifixion of Jesus against Jesus' will. That is blasphemous and that's a lie. Luke 22, 19 to 23. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly the son of man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to inquire among themselves, which of them it was that should do this thing. Did you catch it? Now, this is the very night of his betrayal, right before he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane and prays. He's already told them again, my body will be broken. My blood will be shed for your salvation, for the forgiveness of your sins. So up until the point of the Garden of Gethsemane, up until the point of Jesus' prayer in the garden on that night, even on that very night, Jesus has reiterated, repeated, and emphasized to his followers, I have come for this reason. I, the Son of Man, have come so that the chief priests and the scribes will hand me over to the Gentiles, their rulers, to mock me, whip me, scourge me, beat me, kill me, and be raised on the third day. Right? So let's look at his prayer one more time. Matthew 26, 39 and 42. 
Matthew 26, 39 and 42. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, notice the words, saints. The God-man who speaks perfectly, who lived perfectly, and prayed and prays perfectly. Everything he says, he does utter perfection, even his prayers. Notice again. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. In other words, I am not insisting. I am not insisting. I'm not saying you must take it away. If it's possible for mankind to be saved any other way, and if it's within your will, take it away from me. Now we're going to skip to 42. We don't re need to read 40 and 41. Let's skip to 42. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, Except I drink it, thy will be done. Does that sound like a man who's being forced against his will to drink the cup? Does that sound like a man who's being forced against his will to drink the cup? Let it sink in before I move on. So clear as day, Jesus is not saying, Father, you better take this cup away from me. You must take this cup away from me. And God says, no, you're drinking it whether you like it or not. That's cosmic child abuse. Only a sick demon possessed of the same evil spirit that possessed Muhammad would say this is cosmic child abuse. Only someone demonized, sick demon, Tormented and possessed by a demon, like Muhammad was, the son of Satan, would dare misquote Jesus' words and blaspheme our God and accuse the father of cosmic child abuse. Right? So the question is, and you guys should know the answer already because I've addressed it before. Why then was Jesus Christ, our Lord, so troubled and anguished in his soul? Right? At drinking the cup. Because if you understand what the cup implies, and I've done a session on this, Lord willing, maybe I'll do another one. The cup points to Jesus having to experience broken fellowship and intimacy with the Father and the Spirit, the two persons that he loves and adores more than anything, experiencing something he had never experienced prior to that, Broken fellowship and intimacy with the Father and the Spirit as he then absorbs the divine wrath and the consequence of sin, which is broken fellowship in our place so we can be spared from that. That's what he was dreading. That's what was terrorizing him. The fact I'd have to experience broken fellowship from the Father and the Spirit, the two that I love and adore the most for the first time in my eternal reality. That's what he wanted to avoid if he could. Because what's the consequence of sin? Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 tells you. Your sins, if you don't repent, will remove you from God, separate you from God, where God doesn't look upon you with pleasure and has no fellowship with you and won't answer your prayers. So the consequence of sin is the loss of intimate communion and fellowship with God. So to bear the consequence of our sins, Jesus, as our sin bearer, dying in our place, will now have to experience God forsakenness in that the Father and the Spirit would break fellowship from the Son temporarily so that the Son could experience the penalty of our sins, which is the loss of intimate communion with the two persons he loves the most. And that's what terrified him. You get it? Making sense? And Protestant just quoted Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand, Yehovah's hand, is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy 
that it cannot hear. So then why doesn't he hear us? Why does he save us? But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Your sins has caused a separation where God doesn't look upon you with pleasure, doesn't have communion with you, right? But has turned his back, turned his face from you. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So you see what Jesus was dreading. Exactly, Pedro. You see what Jesus was dreading. He was dreading what was to be hell for him. And what is Jesus' hell? Hell for him is not the flames of the lake of fire. That's nothing. Hell for him is not getting beaten to a bloody pulp, whipped to the point of death, spikes in his hands and his, and his feet, his ankles. That's nothing. Hell for him is to experience for a moment of time the broken fellowship the loss of intimate communion between the Father and the Spirit, whom he loves and adores more than anything, because that's the price he had to pay for our sins. Otherwise, we'd have to pay it and be severed from God's loving communion forever. Right? I did a session on this, and I went through it in depth. And Lord willing, I have an article on this. And Lord willing, I'll do a future session. But is it clear? Notice I didn't use John. Is it clear from Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Jesus wasn't forced against his will. The Father didn't impose on Jesus the crucifixion where Jesus was a helpless <clears throat> victim of God's will so that if that was the case, it would be cosmic child abuse. Right? You see? Did, did that make sense? Did everyone get the point? There is no cosmic child abuse because God the Father said, whether you like it or not, you're drinking the cup. I don't care what you got to say. You're drinking it. Tough luck. Would you say, no, I don't want to drink it. Don't force me. That's cosmic child abuse. Let's read the prayer one more time. Matthew 26, 39, and 42. Matthew 26, 39, and 42. Same thing in Mark 14, 33, 38. But Matthew 26, 39, and 42. One more time. And now I'm going to show you the supernatural, amazing consistency between the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. One more time. Let's read it. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible. Notice if. Notice what he didn't say. Oh, my father, take this cup away from me. You got to take it right now. Notice his prayer. Oh, my father, if it be possible, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will. I am not insisting. I'm not demanding. You got to do it. If it's possible and if it's within your will. And then 42, he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Does that sound like a helpless victim being forced to do something against his will? Or the perfect son who perfectly surrenders to his father's will, even though it's going to cost him hell? What does that sound like? What does that sound like? Now, let me show you how amazing the Bible is. If you want proof for the inspiration of the scriptures and the supernatural consistency between the four Gospels, let me show you John 12, 27 to 30. John 12, 27 to 30. And I've addressed this in the past, but I'm going to address it again because we are creatures of repetition. We need to hear something over and over again until it becomes second nature by the grace of God's spirit. Guys, I need you to focus. Let's not talk about Isaiah 53. Let's focus now. Exactly, King of Kings. I want to repeat what King of Kings sa said. Sounds like the most beautiful selfless person that ever lived. And you are right. 
because he is beauty itself. He is infinite beauty in the flesh. Jesus is beauty. Right. John 12, 27 to 30. Let's read. Guys, you got to pay attention. I may have to post it again. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him, right? An angel spake to him. Notice verse 30. Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now, let me unpack the meat of this. And let me now show you the supernatural consistency between the four Gospels. Okay, pay attention, focus. Notice that when Jesus said, Father, glorify your name, immediately the Father from heaven answered audibly so that the people heard the voice audibly. Some thought it was the sound of an angel from heaven. Some thought it was thunder. Did you see what happened, folks? Pay attention, growing everyone else. Pay attention, please. You see what happened, folks? Jesus said, Father, glorify your name. And immediately God answered audibly, loudly, that others heard it. And Jesus said, that wasn't for my benefit. That voice you heard audibly, that you heard with your ears, wasn't for me. It was for you so you can know who I am. You know why Jesus did that? Because he wanted to show people, I get whatever I ask for. The Father is in love with me and loves me so much. And I always please the Father and always do what delights his heart, that he gives me everything I ask for and never says no. Never says no. Never. Whatever I want, he gives it to me. Let me prove it to you. Father, glorify your name. Immediately he answered. Now, John 11, 20 to 22. John 11, 20 to 22. Let me show you. Because now I'm going to bring in John and tie it in with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John 11, 20 to 22. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Listen to this. But I know that even now, even though he's dead, I know who you are. I know the love of God the Father for you, how much he loves you. Even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee. I have no doubt that you are the beloved of the Father, that he'll give you whatever you ask. Even now, whatever you ask, he gives everything you ask for. Now, does Jesus say she's right? You're absolutely right. Whatever I want, I get from the Father. John 11, 40 to 44. John 11, 40 to 44. Watch here, folks. Watch where I'm going with this. Sheikh, Muhammad is not human. He's not a prophet. He's a dog, a donkey of the devil. John 11, 40 to 44. Read with me. Jesus saith unto her, said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. Didn't I tell you if you believe, you'll see the glory of God? Pay attention. You guys really need to pay attention to be blown away. If this doesn't blow you away, I don't know what will. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes, eyes open. He didn't always close his eyes. He opened his eyes, looked up to heaven and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. I thank you for hearing me. Now notice 42. And I knew that thou hearest me always. You always hear me. Not sometime, not most of the time. You always give me what I ask. You always hear all my petitions and grant it to me. Always, all the time. So why are you praying, Jesus? Notice why. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, loose him and let him go. Did you catch it? Do you see what Jesus said? I'm going to raise Lazarus from the dead physically, 
although he's been dead four days, as the supernatural miraculous proof that the Father always hears me, always gives me what I ask for, gives me everything I desire, not sometime, not most of the time, but always. Did you catch it? Before I move on? You saw what he said? I thank you for hearing me. I know you always hear me. So why are you praying? For their benefit. I'm saying this prayer so they can hear it. So when I raise Lazarus from the dead, this miracle will confirm to them, Father. I know who I am. You know who I am. I know my relationship to you. And I know how much you love me, that you're in love with me as I'm in love with you. And we're in love with the Spirit as the Spirit is in love with us. I know you, you know me. I know who I am, and I know your love for me. So why am I praying, Father? They may know and see through this miracle of raising the dead man. I am your son who delights your heart, your very heart who became flesh, and you always give me whatever I ask. Right? Now let's see why Jesus can get all his requests 100% of the time. John 7, 18, and John 8, 28 to 29. John 7, verse 18, and John chapter 8, verses 28 to 29. He, Jesus speaking. He that speaketh, speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him. The one who seeks God the Father's glory that sent him. The same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. So Jesus is saying, I seek the glory of my Father who sent me, and there's absolutely no unrighteousness in me. I am absolutely pure and sinless. Now notice how sinless and pure Jesus is. John 8, 28 to 29. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man on the cross, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And notice 29. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I always do and say and desire the things that perfectly delight the heart of my father who's in love with me and I'm in love with him and he always gives me whatever I ask. Always. Did you catch it? Not sometimes, always. Now, do the synoptic gospels agree? The father is always pleased with the son because the son always delights the father. Mark 1.11 Matthew 3.17. Mark 1.11 and Matthew 3.17. Because you're going to see where I'm going with this. And here where you're going to get blown away and see how amazing the scriptures are. Mark 1.11 and Matthew 3.17. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Bam. Matthew, Mark, and Luke agree with John. You are my beloved son, the son of my heart, the son whom I love, in whom I am always pleased, well pleased. Matthew 3, 17 repeats it. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well, I, I am well pleased. Did you catch it? Matthew, Mark, and Luke agree with John. Jesus is the beloved son of the father who always pleases the father, whom the father himself said, I am pleased with this one. Now, can I ask you guys a question? Are you guys ready? You guys ready for my question? I was preparing you for this. Okay. What would happen if Jesus always gets what he wants, and the Father always grants every request of Jesus. What would have happened if Jesus had prayed, Father, take this cup away from me, period, full stop, end of story? What would happen?
If Jesus gets everything he asks for, and the Father gives him everything he asks for, and he simply prayed, Father, take this cup away from me. Now, do you see how beautiful Jesus is? Because he didn't pray that prayer. Jesus knowing if he prayed that prayer, then the Father would say, okay, son, you don't die. But now, does it make you appreciate the way Jesus prayed? He said, Father, if it be possible, not my will, but your will be done. Do you see how perfect and beautiful that prayer request was? Do you understand now where I'm going with this? Do you see the difference between saying, Father, take this cup away from me. All right. Okay, son. As opposed to Abba, Father. If it be possible, I'm not insisting, I'm not demanding. Take this cup away from me, but I'm not insisting. If it's within your will, take it away. And the father's response is, son, if you don't drink it, they will. Abba, there's no other way, I'll drink it. Your will be done. You see the difference now? Do you see the difference now? Do you see the difference? Now you're going to see that the Gospels are inspired by the Spirit, which is why they do not contradict themselves. Because now, guys, let's see if you're paying attention. Let's put John 12, 27, back-to-back -back with Mark 14, 36, back-to-back -back with Matthew 26, 39. Let's repeat it again. John 12, 27, back-to-back -back with Mark 14, 36, back-to-back -back with Matthew 26, 39. Let's see. Guys, read it. Read. Read back to back and see the difference. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Not Matthew 14, 36, dude. You're dropping the ball. I'm going to smash your face in. John 12, 27, Mark 14, 36, and Matthew 26, 39. And then I'll repent later. Forgive me, Christians, that I can tell people I love that I'll smash their face in. Get angry at me. Let's do it again. John 12, 27, Mark 14, 36, Matthew 26, 39. Back to back, because I want you to see the difference and why you know these Gospels are inspired by the Spirit, which is why there are no real contradictions. Now we need John 12, 27. Okay, let's start with John 12, 27. Let's see if you guys spot the difference. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. So should I say that? No, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say, Father, save me from this hour. Oh, we got a contradiction, folks, because notice what he says in Mark and Matthew. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Matthew 26, 39. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Guys, you got a contradiction. You see, he said he's not going to pray that prayer, but he prayed that prayer. He prayed that prayer in Matthew and Mark in the Garden of Gethsemane that in John said he wouldn't pray. No, he didn't. There is no contradiction. Because he didn't pray the prayer of John 20, 12, 27 in Mark or Matthew. Pay attention carefully. John 12, 27, he says, Shall I say to the Father, save me from this hour? Full stop. No, I came for this hour to die. Now then, see how he prayed in Mark and Matthew. He didn't say, Father, save me from this hour. Father, all things are possible with you. Take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but you will, as you will. No contradiction because it's not the same kind of prayer. You got it or no?
Do you understand? It's not the same kind of prayer. Did anyone spot the difference or no? Look at John 12, 12 27 one more time. It's got to sink in because Shabir Ali and other Muslims like to say, see contradiction. John says Jesus wouldn't pray this prayer, and he prayed that prayer in Matthew and Mark. No, he didn't. You son of Satan, because you're blinded by your father, you're not paying attention. Notice again John 12, 27. Now is my soul troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Full stop. No qualification. Shall I say, save me from this hour? But for this cause came I unto this hour. That's why I came. Now let's look at Mark 14. We're going to read 33 to 36. Tell me if it's the same kind of prayer. Let's see. You got it? Let's see if you catch it. It's not a rhetorical question only, Angela. Notice the words, Angela. Notice in John 12, 27, the words he says, he won't say is, Father, save me from this hour. Now let's read Mark 14, 33 to 36. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy and saith unto them, my soul, sounds just like John 12, 27, is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Where's the contradiction? Where's the contradiction? Do you guys see how the Holy Spirit superintended the writings of the Gospels to make sure they would not contradict each other? Because in John, he doesn't say, shall I pray to the Father? If it be possible, save me from this hour. No, that's the reason. I, no, he says, what shall I say to the Father? Save me from this hour? Demand he save me? No, I won't pray that prayer. And bam, he didn't pray that prayer. Because in Matthew and Mark, he doesn't say, Father, take this cup away from me. End of story. No, no. Father, if it be possible, if it's within your will, take this cup. Not my will. I'm not insisting. I'm saying if it's within your will and if it's possible. Otherwise, your will be done and I'll drink the cup. I don't think it's saying it's sinking in. And Medic obviously is not paying attention because he just said saying the same thing. I don't know why I let this guy back. For those of you who can see, where is Jesus saying the same thing? Where is Jesus saying the same thing? Is Jesus saying the same thing in John 12, 27 that he said in the garden in Mark 14, 33 to 36 and Matthew 26, 39? Medic came under another name and he's still not getting it because he's still playing video games and upsetting me. He just said he said the same thing. No, you're not. How can you tell me he's saying the same thing? No, Ron, it's not simply he's showing us how to pray. He is revealing, though he comes to drink the cup, it's a cup that's breaking his heart and causing him severe anguish because the cup means he has to experience broken fellowship with the Father and the Spirit for the first time in his eternal existence, something he dreads more than anything. Who didn't get it? Because you guys are silent. Who didn't get the difference? Medic didn't get it. He's playing games with me again. For the rest of you. Do you see it's not the same thing? This is what happens when you play video games for most of your life. Everyone got it? 1611? Do you see there's no contradiction? If you have eyes to see and ears to and read John and Matthew, Mark, and Luke carefully, don't just tell me yes or one if you're not getting it. I want to make sure you're getting it or you're not going to be able to refute this attack and blaspheme against the triune God. So 
So 69, you got it too? Jesus says, what shall I say in John 12, 27? Father, save me from this hour. For this hour I came. And in Mark 14, 36, and Matthew 26, 39, he didn't say, Father, save me from this hour, full stop. Father, take this cup away from me, full stop. He says, Father, if it be possible, take this cup away from me, yet not my will. I'm not saying you must, whether it's within your will, but if it's within your will for me to drink it, then your will be done. Is there any contradiction? Okay, go ahead, Sally Christian. Now, I'm going to test Medic to see if he got it. If not, I'm going to have to block him again. Sorry, brother, because this is not going to be for you. Medic, why did you tell me it's this, uh, he's saying the same thing? Don't lie to me and be honest. Why did you tell me it's the same thing? I don't get what you're saying. Yes, you got it, uh, Pramat Bonsil. So I question, which part of my answer to the brother earlier wasn't clear to you? You mean just because Jesus knows he has to drink it, he can't <clears throat> express anguish and pain at the thought that he has to drink the cup? Okay, if that's what you're saying, medic, I'll buy it and I'll accept it. Unless you're saying this after the fact in order to hide, hide your <clears throat> error, okay? So, Sad Christian, let's, let's try this again. Just because Jesus knows he's going to drink the cup, okay? Just because he knows he's going to drink the cup, that means he shouldn't reveal any anguish and pain that he is experiencing over the fact that the cup means... He's going to break fellowship from the Father Spirit, the two persons he loves the most. So he should just be nonchalant and indifferent about his attitude towards experiencing that type of suffering, which is literally hell for him to be severed from the communion of the Father and the Spirit in your place. So he just should be indifferent about it. Thank you, first and last. Luke says, he dreaded the notion of having to be severed from the communion of the Father and Spirit and experience the divine wrath in our place. That in Luke 22, it says that he started sweating droplet, droplets of blood because that was the hell that Jesus experienced, not the lake of fire, which is nothing to him. It's, it's the fact that in his eternal existence for a moment in time, the two persons he loves and adores the most, he'd be severed from their communion to experience wrath in our place. So we wouldn't have to experience it. You get my point? Let me give you a very bad example that's nothing in comparison to what Jesus is going through. Okay, but I'm going to give you examples, Sai Christian. You have an assigned date. December 26, you're going to be shipped off to an island never to see your, your children again. And you know it's coming, and your children knows it's coming. December 26 comes, and you break down and you start crying as a baby, and your children start crying. But you knew that day was coming, so why are you crying about it? Why are they crying about it? You're now banished to... To an island where you'll never see them again because of some crime you committed. They'll never see you again. You'll never hug them again. You'll never kiss them again. But wait, you knew it's coming, December 26th. So now why are you breaking down and crying? And why are they crying? You knew the day was coming. You with me there? Thank you. So just because Jesus knows he's going to drink the cup, when the time came, his greatest nightmare was now about to become a reality. The Father and the Spirit, whom I love and adore more than anything, now is the time where I'm going to experience broken fellowship and be severed from communion with them for a moment of time. Though this moment is coming, I dread the fact it's here.
You get it now? Exactly, Medic. Is it making sense to every one of you guys? So I wanted to do a session on refuting this wicked, satanic blasphemy, cosmic child abuse. And I pray in Jesus' name, I'm going to call them out by name, Kenny Bonner and a guy named Kareem Ubaidallah, a convert to Satanism, a follower of Satan and his messenger Muhammad. I'm calling these two cowards to debate me and I'll come to their Zoom room and I will humiliate Kenny Bonner and carry Ubaidallah and their wicked prophet, the agent of Satan, and their wicked God, who's not God but Satan himself. I'm calling them out. Let's debate. Watch what I do to your prophet and your God by the grace of the true God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Jesus' power, who is the God and judge and executioner of Muhammad, Muhammad being under the feet of Jesus. Let's see if they'll debate me. I'm calling them out. His name is Kenny Bonner, some grotesque convert to Islam. <clears throat> and Kareem Ubaidallah should be Kareem Abdul Shaitan, Abdul Hadith, because his God is the devil, the father of Muhammad. Let's see if these cowards will debate me. And watch what I do to their blasphemies by the power of the triune God for the glory of Christ, Muhammad's God, judge, and executioner, who is damned Muhammad to hell. Right? Now, before I shut down, does anyone here need further clarification? Is there someone who's confused? Right, and needs further clarification because I don't want to end the session and don't be afraid to tell me. Come on, guys. I need you to be honest with me because I want to make sure you understand the points that it's sunk in. You see how marvelous, how beautiful, how supernaturally consistent the four Gospels are and got a glimpse at the deep love and passion of the triune God and just how amazing Jesus is how great his love is, how great the Father's love and the Spirit's love happens to be for us fallen creatures who don't deserve it, and how Jesus is the perfect communicator who prays the perfect prayers and <clears throat> says the perfect things and does things perfectly always. Is that clear to everyone? Did it make sense? You sure there's nobody confused? And I hope all of you were blessed. But here's what I'm going to encourage you. You need to listen to this session more than once. Understand the arguments and ask the Holy Spirit to help you absorb the arguments. Make it second nature. And now you need to share this. If someone brings this objection, you know how to answer it. And if you don't answer it this way... That either means I'm a terrible teacher or you're terrible listeners. No, 1611, you know why? Because that's after the fact. They'll say, yeah, because now God the Father imposed his will on Jesus. And so Jesus was left with no choice. You get my point, 1611? That's after the Father said, you got no choice, you got to die. That's what they'll tell you. Well, that's not what the Father said, but that's what they'll tell you. You get what I'm saying, 1611? Is it making sense? Of course he said that, 1611. That's after God said, hey, you're going to drink it whether you like it or not. So you have to deal with the passage itself and show how Jesus is already built up to that moment and then focus on how perfect his prayer is and the words that he uses, how perfect they are, Showing what he did not say and what he did say. I don't know if that's good or bad, Ron M. Okay. Is that clear? If it's clear, everyone got it. Forgive me for the distractions. Forgive me for distracting you. Forgive me for being distracted. Lord Jesus willing, I'll try to start doing more live streams during the week. I don't think I'll be able to do any tomorrow because tomorrow I got some recordings, God willing, Lord willing, and then I fly back. But guys, keep praying for me until I'm finally completely free of any and every satanic shackle where the devil uses a corrupt legal system to ensnare me, plead the blood of Jesus to cover me and my daughters, 
plead the blood of Jesus to bring my daughters to me. Plead the blood of Jesus to keep me holy in love with them. Ask the Lord to help me to just get my life back on track again, to raise my daughters in love of Christ if the Lord is pleased. And if he wants me around longer to give me the health I need and also to provide for the ministry, pray for the provisions. Christmas is around the corner. Hopefully the Lord will do something miraculous because next week is Christmas, God willing. And it will be another Christmas without my daughters, my angels. The third Christmas I'll be celebrating without my two beautiful gifts from Jesus, my nine-year-old, seven-year-old. This life sucks, and it sucks royally until Jesus comes and changes it. So, Lord willing, I'll try to see you Friday for a live stream if the Lord wills. But keep praying for me, folks. And I hope you're blessed. Pray that we can get more subscribers, more viewers. Pray that God will make me more like Jesus in holiness and purity and love and discipline and devotion. Pray God will bless my daughters over abundantly and perfectly preserve them and save them. They'll be covered by the blood of Jesus and that I'll see them and hug them and kiss them in Jesus' name. Pray for Sai Christian. Pray for his family. Pray for each other. Pray for Al Darius. Pray for each other. Right? And Lord willing, I will have a Christmas message before Christmas to break down what the scriptures teach about the birth of the virgin-born son of the blessed Mary, the blessed mother of our Lord, in order to enter into Christmas worshiping the God child, the God babe, God becoming born as a babe, as a child, becoming a man to die for us, Rising victorious to give us assurance. Death is not final. Death is the door we enter through to dwell in the presence of Jesus forever and ever. The one who has conquered death, Satan, and sin and conquered our hearts by his love and taken our hearts captive for his glory. May our hearts be his throne forever and ever. Lord Jesus, our hearts belong to you. My daughter's hearts belong to you. May our hearts be your everlasting throne. Sit and throne on our hearts forever because we are in love with you, Lord Jesus, because you are in love with us. We thank you, Son of God. Christ is risen, risen indeed. See you soon, Lord willing.